Alright, in this video, we're going to talk about cell potential and free energy. If you recall, we talked about free energy a couple of lessons ago, <clears throat> and that is what we call delta G. So delta G, our Gibbs free energy, right, is equal to a minus N, which is the number of moles of electrons that are exchanged in our redox reaction, times our Faraday constant, which is 96,486 coulombs per mole of electron times our cell voltage which is measured in joules per coulomb which is a volt okay and so to calculate our free energy we multiply those three things together and there's a negative sign out front and that has to do with the fact that for a reaction to be spontaneous remember delta g has to be negative and the e must be positive So if those two things are true, then the reaction is spontaneous. So let's put this into action. So on this example, is exercise 17.3 from your textbook. The delta G for the reaction, we want to calculate. Again, we're going to do that by doing minus NFE. Okay. So for this reaction, copper is going from a plus 2 down to a 0. And so that is our reduction. And then iron is going from a 0 to a plus 2, so that is our oxidation. And as you recall from the last, <coughs> excuse me, from the last um, lesson, the one that oxidizes is the one that we flip, we have to flip the reduction reaction around and change the sign. But you'll see here that that has already been done in our notes for us. Because this is the cell potential for this written as an oxidation reaction. Alright, so then to calculate later delta G, we need to say N minus N, again, is the number of moles of our electrons that were exchanged. In this instance, there are two moles of electrons being exchanged, times our Faraday's constant, which is 96,486, times our cell potential, and to get the cell potential, we just add these two together, and so we get 0.78. And so then when we multiply those together, we calculate our delta G, and we find that that value is a negative 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules. All right. So that's how we calculate delta G from our cell potential. And again, the value of Faraday's constant is in your reference packet, so you don't have to memorize that and you would be provided the information to calculate your cell potential. And then, of course, your N is just the number of electrons after you've balanced the reaction. So in the next part is to talk about the dependence of cell potential on concentration. Now, we want to think about what happens if our concentration is greater than the one molar that is our standard. So we're going to think about Le Chatelier's principle. An increase in the concentration of a reactant will drive the reaction in a forward direction. And if you recall, right, the forward direction means it's going to be going towards the products, making more product. So if we're making more product, we're increasing the driving force of, um, on our um, electrons and thereby increasing our, our cell potential. So if, if the change in concentration makes the reaction shift to the right towards the products, then the cell potential would increase and you'd have a greater electromotive force. However, if the change in the concentration forced the reaction to shift to the left, that would mean that we would have a decreasing cell potential. So if we take our problem up above here, we had our copper plus two, which was an aqueous, and our iron solid, going to our copper solid, and our iron plus two as an aqueous solution. So Standard condition says that they're all at one mole, all of our solutions are at one molar. But if the copper were, say, at two molar, that would be an increase, right? So we're increasing the concentration of the copper ions, which would shift the reaction to the right, and thereby increasing the value of E. However, if we made the concentration of copper 0.5 molar, that's a decrease from one, and so that would shift the reaction to the left decreasing the cell potential, okay? 
we'll look at that some more in a lab activity we're going to do later in the week. All right, so the final piece of this unit is talking about, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, before we move on to that, we have some more example problems here. So we want to predict whether or not E is larger or smaller. Okay, so in this instance, if our concentration of aluminum is 2 and our concentration of magnesium is 1, what would happen? So again, we're increasing the concentration of aluminum, right? It's greater than 1. So that means the reaction would shift to the left and thereby it would decrease E. In this instance, we're increasing our aluminum concentration. Alumi sorry, it's staying the same at 1, but we're increasing the concentration of the manganese. Again, increasing your reactants shifts your reaction to the right, which would increase our cell potential. Okay. All right, now, now the final piece of our um, unit is on electrolysis. Uh, now, electrolysis is where we force a reaction to occur. Okay, the cells, the galvanic and voltaic cells we were looking at before were spontaneous processes. Electrolysis is not a spontaneous process. This is where we have to supply electrical energy to force a chemical change. Okay, so we use electrical energy to produce chemical change as opposed to chemical change producing electrical energy that we looked at in the previous lesson. So this process involves um, forcing a current through a cell to produce a chemical change for which the cell potential is negative or non-spontaneous. The electrical work that causes a non-spontaneous reaction okay, to occur. So examples would be charging a battery and electroplating. Right? So every time you plug your cell phone in, you are reversing the chemical reaction by supplying Applying electricity. So you're forcing the reaction to go in the dire opposite direction that it goes while you're using your cell phone, for example. Okay? The other thing that we're going to be looking at more in depth is electroplating. This is how we make jewelry. So they force the reaction to um, go in the non spontaneous direction, thereby allowing for the um, solid that you want to deposit on the jewelry, such as gold or silver. All right. This is, again, electroplating is the depositing of our neutral metal onto an electrode by using um, a solution and forcing that solution to go in the direction which it does not want to go. Okay. So we do have some new vocabulary that we want to look at. And this vocabulary is not actually in your notes, but as we want to make sure that we understand some things about vocabulary. So a Coulomb is a charge transported by a steady current of one amp in one second. So again, a coulomb is one amp per second. Okay, now an amp is a measure of electrical current. And that is equal to one coulomb per second. So an amp is one coulomb per second. Okay, if there are 10 amps of current, it can also be expressed as 10 coulombs per second. That's important in the process problems that we're going to be looking at here in a moment. Okay. So this breaks down this problem into multiple steps here. So how long must a current of 5 amps be applied to a solution of silver ions to produce 10.5 grams of silver metal? So our first step is to start with our grams of silver metal, convert those to moles. Okay. So if I have 10.5 grams of silver, I convert it to moles, so one mole of silver is 107.9 grams, and so then we calculate and we find we get 0 .0973 moles of silver. Okay. All right, so then we have to multiply that by the number of electrons which are required. Right, so how many electrons are required to turn silver plus one into silver solid, which has zero charge? Right, so just one electron. So this would be our 0 0.0973 moles of silver, and for every mole of silver, that requires one electron. Right, 
Then we want to convert our coulombs per mole, and we're going to use Faraday's constant to do that. So if you recall, Faraday's constant from our previous notes a couple pages back, right, told us told us the number of coulombs per mole, right? So we want to convert two coulombs. We have 0 0.0973 moles now of electrons. And we convert that one, every one mole of electrons, right, has 96,485 coulombs. Right? So then we multiply that. And we finally have 9,388 coulombs, okay? Then we multiply by the amps, which is a coulomb per second, right? So we have 9,388 coulombs, right? And, and so our amps, remember, this is the same as a coulomb per second, right? That means we have five coulombs for every one second, and that should say divide to get to time, right? So our coulombs would cancel, and we would divide and get our time, which is 1,878 seconds. Okay. That would be then our answer. Okay, of course, if they asked for it in minutes, we could convert that to minutes by divided by 60 seconds per minute. Okay, so let's try another problem here. You try and then come back and we'll look at it together. So pause the video and you try and then return when you're finished. Okay, so remember. 10 amps are the same, is the same thing as 10 coulombs per second. Now this breaks this down into multiple steps, but we can do this as one long problem. So I'm going to do that down here and just follow my steps. So we start with our um, 10 coulombs per second. Now I can get rid of seconds by multiplying by my time, right, which is 30 minutes. Hmm, but how many seconds is that? Right, so right, 30 minutes. We get to seconds, we multiply by 60 seconds per minute, right? So that would be 180, sorry, 1800 seconds. So our seconds would cancel, right? Not least just with coulombs, right? So now we can use Faraday's constant to help us find the moles of electrons, right? Faraday's constant, remember, is 96,000. Uh, well, let's get the numbers next to the Look at that, 96. 1,485 coulombs for every mole of electrons. So our coulombs cancel, right? So now, now we are at moles of electrons. All right, so now we have to determine our moles of electrons of copper, right? So in this case, copper is a plus two. So how many electrons do we need to get the copper? Zero, right? We would have to have two electrons for every mole of copper, right? So we have two moles of electrons for every one mole then of copper. Because again, copper was a plus two, going to a copper zero. And that's where that two moles of electrons comes from. And then finally we can convert our copper into grams. So one mole of copper. And then we look up the molar mass of copper. And we find the molar mass of copper. 63 0.55, and then we multiply across the top, divide by the bottom. And we find the answer to be 5.94 grams that we got here at the bottom. Now you are welcome to do this in a stepwise fashion as we did the previous problem, or you can do it um, in a similar fashion to a stoichiometry problem way is acceptable. And so we'll look at more practice of this in class tomorrow.